All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started in the interest of time. I know that our county executive elect will be joining us shortly. Um, I, I wanted to just start off by saying that this is a follow-up um, to a meeting that we first had in November of last year when we had this conversation, so uh, roughly about a year ago about our evidence of learning. Ah, perfect timing. And uh, certainly uh, look forward to an update in terms of our progress. Uh, it's interesting because uh, in the context of our uh, election campaigns and being out there and talking to constituents, I don't think enough people realize about what continues to go on in our uh, Montgomery County Public Schools about trying to continue to look at evidence uh, and data to help to shape us in terms of ensuring that we're continuing to refocus uh, our initiatives as well as our curriculum and things to ensure that we're reaching all of our students. And uh, I really just want to say uh, kudos to you, Dr. Smith and to MCPS as a whole uh, for continuing to be committed to looking at the data. We ask all of our departments right, to look at uh, uh, data-informed uh, ways in which you can make uh, your system better uh, and make it operate better for our kids. And certainly by doing things like this, uh, it certainly helps to shape that and move us in that direction. It's something that we talk about uh, on the Kerwin Commission uh, and certainly something that I think that uh, will continue to be a model uh, as we move forward about progressing the entire state forward in being even more globally competitive than we currently are. Uh, I did want to acknowledge two of our, or three, I'm sorry, of our uh, board members that are here. Uh, current president, still uh, Mr. Michael Durso, uh, Vice President Shebra Evans, and of course, uh, who's been now, uh, uh, and so Ms. Shebra Evans has been, uh, you weren't on the ballot, Shebra, so no. no. All right, that's right. And you weren't on the ballot either. So not, you weren't on the ballot done. either. So Miss Dixon, it's that's right. Okay, okay. So that's why they look so refreshed. That's why you look so fresh and yeah, relaxed. relaxed. So we've got Miss Dixon and Miss Evans, uh, Vice President Evans and Miss Dixon, who uh, are on the board and joining us this morning. And so thank you very much for being here. Uh, to our superintendent, Dr. Jack Smith. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, Mr. Howard, I'll turn it over to you. Unless my colleagues have any initial uh, comments to kind of just walk us through. Uh, I know that we have a presentation today that. Uh, MCPS will be giving us, and so we look forward to that data, and then we'll have questions at the end, I'm sure. I'm just going to really turn it over to, to MCPS. The packet just kind of summarizes the background of the, the committee's work looking at um, performance measures, and the committee requested that after uh, the, the MCPS staff gives updates to the board, um, that the MCPS come and, and give a similar update to the committee. Um, and, and last, so we did that last November, then actually in, in February, um, Dr. Smith and his team gave the update to the full council so the full council could hear it. So this is kind of the next step um, following up uh, on those uh, previous sessions. Good morning, and I would say uh, congratulations on the election results for each of the three of you, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on behalf of the 163,000 and their families and all of the people in this uh, community, the residents who support our school system so well. And so I uh, just say that. Uh, Dr. Smith, can you say that okay. number again? Because again, I think that. 163,000 pre-K through 12th grade students. And I think again that folks, as we were on the campaign trail, all three of us know, people don't appreciate just how large our system is uh, and truly how many children we're educating each and every day uh, here in Montgomery County, so, yeah. So we'd like to share with you uh, several things today, um, and I would just start by, by saying that this is, continues to be an effort to spend less time talking about who we're teaching, because we spend a lot of time about who we're teaching. Am I teaching the gifted class, or am I teaching, you know, the students in this part of the county or that part of the county, and spend more time talking about how we teach and what we teach so that we reach every single student. And we have worked together across uh, literally uh, thousands of people in this county, uh, many, many stakeholders across our employee associations and our advocacy organizations uh, to think about a strategy that would show us 
how we need to proceed forward with uh, our children and how we serve them and support them in their learning and in their well-being. And so what you have in front of you is a multifaceted strategy that uses three things, really. The first is evidence of learning. I'm going to show you the second year of evidence of learning data. I'm going to point out some areas that we have questions about and, and why we have questions about. The second area is the school improvement planning process. This has been around since the 80s. This, this, and frankly, I'll be blunt, it is for a long time was a kitchen sink strategy. You put everything in the kitchen sink and then you wonder what's in there and, and you don't really give any of it priority. Uh, over the last uh, year and a half, we've really looked at fine-tuning that school improvement planning process as a school system so that it is more focused on the students' achievement levels, their progress levels, and uh, their well-being. As you know, we're working on physical, social, and psychological well-being. So those areas, because let's be clear, number two is where the work gets done. In that little school building on that slide, in the classrooms, the hallways, the offices, the cafeterias. The work is not in the data. The work is not in the central office. That's the support for the system of schools so that we can uh, actually you know, know that we have consistency across 206 schools and that we have consistency in teaching to the standard and have high expectations. And then finally, what you didn't see last year, and you and I have talked about this before, and I've talked about it with all of you and with the council, is the actual individual impact of each school. And so today we're going to share some information, more complete information about that. And that's developing. And we'll, all of these things are not projects. None of them will ever be done, especially the school improvement planning process. It's constantly uh, a work in progress because as the society changes, as the community changes, as the workforce changes, we have to constantly be thinking about what do our students need now and in the future, not what did they need seven, eight, 10, 15 years ago. And so you can see each of these pieces and we'll just walk through the data and, and that's just to give you the graphic uh, so that you understand. You remember the readiness information? I'm not gonna go through that again. We wanna make sure students are ready second to third, fifth to sixth, eighth to ninth, and to walk out the door to choose the options and choices that are in our community. So the first thing you see is our overall literacy data from one year to the next, and you can see the uh, over on the side the key that there uh, is growth um, and in each of these areas. And if we can show you in our terms, the growth would be you know uh, in the yellow range and green range in terms of seeing what happens. And I want to point something out to you here that I think is particularly important. From the first year to the second year of this, we changed the elementary, so second and fifth grade would be included, grade scale in the, the county. Probably my first year here, I heard from no fewer than uh, two or 3,000 people about their frustration with the grade scale. And so uh, our director of elementary curriculum instruction, Nikki Hazel, did a great job working with a vast number of schools and community members and all of the other uh, stakeholders and partners, and they changed the grade scale. So one of the things we want to look at and see is this 4.6% increase, to what degree did the grade scale help that, affect, hurt it, leave it, you know? Because when we think about the three measures here, classroom, district, and external measures, there has to be calibration. People say, well, you want to use, you want to use grades and district measures to make us look better. No, because if we're not looking at those external measures and if they're not consistent, then we're not doing our work. We've got to be looking at all the measures together all the time. And when any one measure changes, which we know, and by the way, you may have heard the park test is gone, it's not exactly accurate. The park test will be here this spring. It'll have a different name, same test. In tw the spring of 2020, it'll be many of the same items with that new name that's applied this spring. So it's an evolutionary process. And so when we look at that, we'll, we see we want to constantly be calibrating these things and say, what is the level of learning that our students are experiencing? And so we look at it overall in literacy. Then we can look at the question. Yes. Yes. Yep. Council Member Howard. So of the, it says measures in two categories. But 
I don't know which categories they made it in and which categories okay. they didn't make it in. And what's it mean? I mean, do you ascribe any meaning to any of the particular categories? Well, I mean, it would be interesting to know if you didn't make it in the external, in any of these, what does that say? If you didn't meet it in the district. What's that Absolutely, set? and and as we uh, started this work last year, we are constantly looking at that. And you know, if we if we report that level of data out in this sort of thing, then you're going to have to have many, many more slides and many, many more levels. So we can certainly provide that to you. But we okay. we calibrate that, and we show you we show everyone which it's all on our website. What are the measures in each of the three categories? And what's our level of performance? And actually, in here, you're going to see some indications, for example, in middle school math of what the external measure said versus what this says. And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you see that, uh, because we, it's not the external measure alone. It's the, the measures working together to show evidence that the students are indeed learning, because anybody can have a bad day on any one thing, or sometimes our students aren't all motivated to get straight A's but they're learning the content and they can demonstrate mastery in a variety of ways. So if you look here for our African-American student readiness, you can see there where that is in terms of uh, the system. And when we get to the uh, third part, the school impact, we'll show you system data for elementary, middle, and high school and how we're going to talk about individual school impact. So this, uh, this information will become clear school by school instead of just at the system level. And one other thing I want to point out is in the 11th grade, you, you're going to see a steady drop over and over. We changed the measure because the first measure was on track for graduation, which has long been a measure everywhere in the world. The problem with that is we know that students can actually graduate and not be very well prepared. So we changed it to the college career readiness standard instead of just on track with credits. Credits and movement toward graduation is necessary. It's not sufficient. Students need to graduate with all of that done, but also with real value in that diploma. The weight of that diploma varies from student to student. And we want to do all we can to, to add more weight to diplomas where there aren't a lot of options when kids graduate. So. You know, Dr. Smith, that's that's a really important point and ties into, again, current recommendations. So mm -hmm. um, I find ourselves, uh, when I look at what MCPS is doing in terms of its movement, uh, it certainly is moving towards where uh, Kerwin is asking all of our LEAs uh, to be aligned. And so from that perspective, we'll be ahead of the curve yes. uh, in making some of those changes, which will be great. Uh, I've encouraged all school systems throughout the state of Maryland to start moving in this direction as we see this, because some of these things aren't budgetarily driven. These are things that are going to be policy issues. And so from that perspective, those aren't ones that are subject to whether or not the governor will fund it. These will be recommendations that our General Assembly will likely be putting forth uh, as an omnibus sort of package in terms of policy. And so again, I just want to uh, say to you, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you're working on some of these things now uh, because it's so much easier to get out ahead of them instead of uh, once these uh, uh, policies come down from Annapolis. I did just very quickly want to acknowledge that uh, Jill Ortman Faust uh, from our school board is here as well and really wanted to say a special thank you to you. I know that you'll be leaving the school board and you've been a tremendous advocate uh, in the community, uh, working incredibly hard to make sure that people's voices are heard, uh, that you're interacting with them and being a true community servant. So. Thank you very much for your service on the school board. You've done a great service to the folks in Montgomery County and specifically our parents, teachers, and students within MCPS. So thank you for that. I have a question. Yep. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you. And I echo the congratulations as well um, to everybody and uh, really do appreciate uh, Ms. Ormans Fowles's um, extraordinary uh, activism and advocacy. And I know it's not going to end. So <laughs> <laughs> perhaps you won't be staying at that table, but I know that we can count on you to continue to be a part of this um, of this effort. I just had a quick um, clarifying question. So what you're saying in terms of the data uh, for the 11th grade, which I didn't know, you know, all throughout, it is seems to be a mm -hmm. challenge. So are you saying that you have changed the way that you are calculating this? We changed and the measurement. And, and uh -huh. once you did that, this is what 
This right. is what you discovered? Yeah, which okay. is actually good news because if, if in 1617 you can see for African American students it was 79.3%. Yeah. When we applied the college career readiness standard, which is the SAT, the ACT, the Accuplacer, certification licensure in a career pathway, the local uh, agreement with Montgomery College for mm -hmm. A's and B's and rigorous courses, when you apply that standard, which is a higher standard, you move to 77.4. Mm -hmm. I was very encouraged by that number. But we've got to have that level of standard or it, it's not an accurate picture of what's happening with students. Right, so I guess what you expect is that for the next school year, then are you going to utilize this data to figure out what yes. else needs to be strengthened? Absolutely. So that's that's yeah. constantly refine yeah. what we do and how we do it so it's getting the most precise, accurate measurements yeah. of what, what we're doing. Great, thank you. Member Alex. So, uh, Montgomery College has come to us and talked about the number of kids who need remediation in both math and reading, and it's an extraordinarily large number. So how does that jive with this? Well, for the last two years, I think you would find that different, and that is that we've entered into an agreement with Montgomery College to say that students who earn A's and B's in appropriate English and math classes at the 12th grade level don't go into remedial classes. And the initial, last year, the initial data coming out indicates that those students are being as or more successful. So what that says is, proves my point very clearly, that a score on an Accuplacer is not the only, the only way to know if a student is ready. And unfortunately, the Accuplacer was giving us lots of false negatives. Lots of kids who were not being successful on the Accuplacer went into the coursework and are as or more successful than students who are successful in the Accuplacer or on the SAT or whatever. So it's, that's why you got to have lots of ways of thinking about it. They haven't shared that with us yet. Yeah. That's, that's actually one of the things that uh, Dr. Ivory Tolson uh, has based a lot of his work mm -hmm. on in Breaking mm -hmm. Barriers uh, and understanding that when you have a high stakes test that's outside of, uh, so it's even with our SAT and ACTs, and it's the reason why it's interesting as I was going to now with college visits for my daughter who's in 11th grade, uh, <laughs> they, they look at the test, but they have a wide margin right. of what's acceptable to them. What they're looking at is actual grades mm -hmm. and your AP test scores mm -hmm. for a particular subject that happens in the context of that classroom. And that's what I want to remind people about, that AP test is happening in the context of that classroom class that you're taking. And so from that perspective, while I know it's a separate test, it's within that framework. As you go to an Accuplacer that's outside of school, that you go to on a different day, and it's like not your teacher that's there, it's those kinds of things that are very different, and people don't take it the same way and don't have the same connectivity that's there as they do inside the classroom. And so from that perspective, I just think, again, that uh, it's a great direction to see that our institutes of higher education are moving that way. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of it, Council Member Elrich, was based on uh, what happened with the plans of uh, institutes of higher education and their enrollment and classes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they're a bus they have a business model. Right. And so that plays into this as well, just to be real. So, That's you know, to have, to have that now not be there and not rely upon folks to have to take a remedial class that costs them money and doesn't contribute to their credits at the end of the day and for, towards graduation, I mean, that's just money that's tossed in for nothing. So we're really actually saving a lot of our kids who are at risk uh, in a lot of instances, uh, money that's thrown down the drain and also time uh, and getting them uh, a more accurate representation of whether or not they've actually mastered the subjects. So, Councilmember Navarro. Yeah. Um, so, so I think it would be important for us as a committee to try to gauge uh, after this shift, you know, what the difference has been. I assume that many students, and I've heard many students, just give up, right? I mean, if if you know that now you're going to have to a spend money on remediation, that it's not going to give you any credits, et cetera. Many just, you know, so that whole thing about completion, the data is mm -hmm. always, you know, so startling how it's just not, a, not good news. Um, I, I assume this is going to have an impact on that as well, that we need to, you know, track um, and, and better try to advocate for the students, many of which, of course, are working two, three jobs, you know, and just can't afford 
so they just literally give up. Um, so this is another area I think very interesting to track, mm -hmm. see how, how that moves the needle. Yes. It's a, they, they had done a very small study the year before I came, and we did a larger study my first year, and this past year was the first year of enrollment based on that local agreement with Montgomery College. So tremendous good step forward. And the AccuPlacer and, you know, all tests have flaws. It's a particularly flawed test. Yes, it, is. it is. And I, I don't bash tests or praise tests. It just isn't, isn't a very good representation and of that. So I'm thrilled that we have other ways to get there. Uh, if you see there for our Hispanic Latino literacy readiness, once again, the 7.8 change uh, over time. We want to check and see what, what did the elementary shift in the classroom grades did it affect it positively, negatively, or not at all? Then we always want to, and we're going to show you our strategy to always break things down, not just by uh, race and culture, but also by, by economic status. Because people often say when we talk about the, and I'll use the term that's commonly used, the gaps, um, they often say, well, uh, you know, is it race or poverty? And my answer is both. And we need to separate that and look at it because we should not paint any group of people with a single brush. It's, it's unconscionable and it never gives us good data or good ways of thinking about how to meet their needs or if they're excelling, how to support them. Because when people are excelling, you certainly don't want to say to them, you're not excelling through your language or your actions. And so then we can look and see, here's how our African-American students who are not identified in poverty progressed. And our Hispanic Latino students, yes? Can, and so it's interesting because I, I did want to highlight, and it's something that Councilmember Rivera was addressing when we were talking about the 11th grade, even at that level to where you have non-farm students and you still see that drop in 11th grade. Mm -hmm. So it certainly holds the correlation that it's not even, that, that it's not something that's just for our kids that may be at risk, it's for all of our that's kids right. to yep. where it's really that fundamental shift. So that's where data comes in that really helps you to see that it's across the board. And so, okay, thank you. When you see the equity accountability model in here, you're really going to see a way to see that, you know, a, as a, a member of the community, as a parent, where it makes sense without looking through 30 pages of information because we have to make things straightforward and clear for people. Uh, and so if you look at uh, Hispanic Latino students who are not uh, identified as in poverty, and then you can see now the next page, African American stu students who are in poverty, you see some significant disparities, differences here. And, and this really calls upon us to work, to do our work. And we're talking about each individual student. Because you also see that, you know, in second grade, uh, three-fourths of the students did meet two or three of the three measures. But that's still an area where we have to really, and then we need to look at the external measures and the district measures to make sure that they're all calibrated together. And we're going to constantly do that. And then we'll, we'll always have and know those numbers behind it because we, if something's out of sync, then you gotta say, well, how do we do this? What, what's going on here? Um, yeah, you know, I, obviously I think that this right here is a clear indication that as of now we move into a new era of leadership in the county with our executive elect sitting right here, <laughs> um, the new council members coming in, you know, we do need to marry all of these data points with everything else that we're doing in the county uh, through our departments, through you know, legislation. I mean, we will start doing some really great work on this whole issue of the equity policy, but we really do need to get, you know, to address uh, these issues of literacy readiness. You know, when I look at the Latino farms and mm -hmm. the African American farms, um, these are startling numbers they in are. terms of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I know that we we see progress, but it is it's just the consequences of this, right? The impact mm -hmm. of this uh, in in terms of our indicators of of uh, you know quality of life in the county of what's going to happen with these you know students going forward. You know, mm -hmm. um, what does it mean when we talk about expanding our tax base if we're still dealing with this? So I I am really truly looking forward to how we enhance and strengthen the way 
we look at every single policy area yes. uh, to move the needle. And that will mean focusing and prioritizing some initiatives uh, to farm uh, s children and families, right? You know, mm -hmm. people, you know, children and families in poverty. I mean, I, we're going to have to do that. Absolutely. Uh, because money is not, uh, you know, that abundant. But if we do find and identify some money, um, this definitely is where we need to, to focus because mm -hmm. we have got to stabilize this, the, you know, these, these areas and, and, and these cohorts. Um, and the fact is also that these are cohorts that are continuing to grow in numbers. Uh, so yes. it even calls for a much greater urgency around how do we begin to truly strategically and intentionally focus our resources and our best practices right there. So I, I have to, you know, I do applaud your leadership and the board's leadership in really, you know, doing that kind of very <coughs> targeted look at where we are because if we don't know, then how do we address it? Uh, you know, a lot of people like to shy away or like to package data differently so it looks a certain way. Um, so this is commendable because we, we all have to work together um, to, to get to that. But, um, but it does, you know, it gives me heartburn when I look at, at some of those numbers. I agree. Still to this day. I agree. And it's, just, it's, it's absolutely critical that we think about how to maintain the high level of excellence and bring about equity so that we have a high level of excellence for everyone. And there's no such thing as mediocre equity. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's got to be it. And when we look at our, and in a few minutes you'll see the, the white and Asian students who are not in poverty and our equity accountability model, they become, whether you talk about the standard of reaching all kids to 90% or higher, or you look at their performance, they're the same thing. They're above 90%. And we have to absolutely have to maintain yeah. that for them. Absolutely. But here's the work over here. Yeah. We can eliminate well, those Well, excellence is not finite. And That's so right. the framing, it's always, you know, this has always been an area of interest for me. That's How right. do we really find a way to change this narrative? Um, especially because if we don't address this issue, right, right. then we do run the risk of having a school system where even those who are doing so well, okay, may not have those opportunities That's because right. it's it's so draining mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of what we have to do. And so this notion of, you know, being strategic and stabilizing, you know, these cohorts of students uh, at the same time as we make sure that excellence continues, you know, to be the standard for everybody. I know it's possible. So do I. And I, and I think that you know we're we're headed there, obviously. Um, but it does mean some that we're going to have to make some very important decisions, um, budgetary wise, you know, um, mm -hmm. and um, and it will be up to all of us to mm -hmm. frame this in a way that folks, you know, who are doing very well and families who are doing very well understand that this does is not to somehow um, erase or water down any of that. No. It is to actually provide those opportunities for everybody, and that's how we will have an excellent school system for, you know, for decades and decades right. to come, yep. right? So um, I look forward to, to, to how we work together to reframe that narrative, because uh, it's always been a challenge, I think, mm -hmm. in our county. Um, but, you know, these are, this, this is our student population, as I always like to say. It's not like these are the changing demographics. This is our demographic. It's our children. It is up to That's us right. to serve them. Um, so. And the children aren't broken. The adolescents no. aren't broken. Oh my gosh. I, I, no. I push back very hard on that. No. And I know you agree with me on that. Absolutely. The, the issue is children need, adolescents need what they need in school to be Absolutely. successful and to go forward in their lives. And it's our job as the adults to provide that. And it's, as I said before, it's unique, it's individual, it's personal. We can't paint any group of students by school, by race, yeah. by poverty, by language with one brush. Absolutely. And, and that's really the key. It, it is, to you know, it's, it's the asset model, right? Yep, and, that's and, right. Uh, and that's why I always say that notion that excellence is not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like it's finite. Uh, it's just access to opportunities. I mean, that's where it's at. And uh, so, so again, I think it's timely that we are, that we, you know, we continually have to recommit ourselves, I think, as, as we move, mm -hmm. you know, forward. As well. Thank you. I will point out the eighth grade gain there. That was yeah. not based on any change in anything. That was 
and that's really real effort on the part of our teachers and our our staff members across our school buildings yeah. to that's amazing I actually had that highlighted yep yeah. the mathematics readiness it's always lower I continue to say loudly and I think it's up to our uh, current federal administration our new Congress to step out and say as a country we're going to take a stand around mathematics is the foundation to all hard science to all engineering to all technology much the way they did after Sputnik in 1956 somebody's got to stand up at the federal state level and say we're going to put our resources our energy and we're going to tell everyone we don't pay enough attention to the foundational value of mathematics in our society and it's we're going to live to regret that if we don't change soon and we're going to change in Montgomery County whether they change or not and so a lot of the effort right now is around getting the most effective mathematics instructional materials and the most effective instructional capacity which means that we don't just think about math content or using this strategy of you know think pair share we think about mathematics content we think about the instructional strategy we think about cultural responsiveness we think about biases and expectations we have we think about the well-being of the students in our classroom their social and, and psychological well-being and that's how we want our medical professionals to think that's how we want our educational professionals to think that's how we want all integrated systems to think in this work that we do and it really calls upon educators I as a person who started teaching in 1980 to think very differently about my craft and and that's a lot of the work we're doing so you can see through here the mathematics numbers they they cause me to have a, a knot in my stomach all the way through and they're not nearly as good anywhere as we are in literacy and that is a real concern for all of us and it's you see some improvements and some of them in like in the eighth grade I can say I'm going to show you why the ones in the eighth grade happened and that goes to access and opportunity and we'll get to that in just a minute but we can go all the way through these and you see the same patterns over and over as we go through them but uh, we're on our way we're not there yet we'll never be there in the minute we think we're there we'll slide backwards but we're getting things refined and that's a slow cumber cumbersome process but it's worth doing right as we regroup bring people back together rethink constantly and you know it's nice to look back at something and say you should have done this you should have done that well I always say to those people would you have known to do that then before you knew all of this hindsight is really good but it's the working together going forward that changes the world and I read recently a quote I love by John Dewey the educator of the first half of the 20th century he said people don't learn from experience people learn from reflecting upon their experiences so if we don't think about what happened we don't learn from it if we just keep doing it over and over we've we've seen some of that in life so you can see at the end we have some dashboards up and there's the link and they're up and that's one of the things that I shared with the board that we would make sure we do they said we want you to do that and you said to me are you going to do this and we said yes we have the first sets up and we'll continue to add to them all of this year and forever and, and, and Dr. Smith that is where count, uh, to uh, Council Member Albert's question that the breakdowns would be a little bit more in depth. A lot of it's there, there. Okay. and it will all be there eventually. Okay. You'll be able to see Perfect. every bit of it, and we'll send you some data that sits Beautiful. behind these currently. Excellent, thank you. So now we're going to talk about Maryland College and career readiness because there are some really interesting facts in here, and I want to say at this point, before I turn it over to Dr. Wilson, we completely support the conversation and the rec initial recommendations out of Kerwin to move this measure to the end of 10th grade. We think that makes perfect sense and in fact that's in a, uh, a uh, document the board recently created and sent to uh, the Kerwin Commission so Dr. Wilson so this data that you're looking at uh, at this point in time is the start for the class of 2019 so we take a look at the end of the junior year and we say to schools these students have accomplished the college and career readiness standards these students have not you have a senior year to continue your work to get them through 
uh, to meet one of the various ways that you can be considered college and career readiness and at ready. And as we talked, it's things like a, a certain score on an SAT, on an ACT, a certain core of classes with our partnership with Montgomery College that if you get these particular grades in our specified classes, you can enter and you can take credit-bearing courses. Also the Accuplacer, as we've spoken, dual enrollment courses. There's an array of ways to be able to be counted in these numbers. So this is a status report for the class of 2019. And again, I want to point out that you do see, to use the word gap again, uh, a big difference between the Asian and white performance and when you compare that for the starting point for our black and African American or African American students and our Hispanic and Latino students. However, one thing that I would like to report is the, the act passed uh, in 13, uh, the first class we reported on was the class of 2017. For Montgomery County Public Schools, that was a pretty large graduating class, class of 2017. And I want to say that what we are finding from these numbers for the class of 2019 is where we're starting with the class of 2019, finishing out their senior year, is where we ended with the class of 2017 and 2018. So we're in a better place. We have as high a numbers as we did when we completed with those classes. So for example, Class 17 is much higher, uh, much larger, and that's what percentages do to us, is we always have to think about the N in relative to that. And as you pointed out, our demographics uh, is different every year. And so, for instance, the farms number, just by comparison, between uh, those two classes of 17 and 18, went up about 800 students, just the farms category in those two classes. Uh, graduating classes. So when we think about percentages, we have to keep that in mind. So I did want to mention that it is definitely uh, good news of, of where we started. Then um, as we transition to the accountability model, you'll know that we have uh, particular focus groups in our accountability model. So our data reporting is starting to look at this group of students in addition to all other students. So we are looking at non-farms students, uh, both in the black or African-American, Hispanic, Latino groups, and all other non-farms, everyone else who is not in that category. And then we're comparing their progress with students who are in poverty because we see very distinctive differences when you take remove the poverty factor and look at the, the group without that. We see different kinds of numbers, as you can see. Um, we also, in our uh, board presentation of this data, invited three of our principals to come and um, talk about what they're doing with college and career readiness from Paint Branch, Rockville, and Wheaton. We're proud, to, we're proud of the accomplishments they've made by concentrating on all of those ways, those measures uh, that we can get students to be college and career ready. You notice the downtick in uh, Paint Branch's mathematics. That's, again, a cause for reflection. What do we do? What can we do better? Uh, how can we approach this a little bit different than we did in the prior year? Also, there's a little influence on the overall number of N in the class also that we have to factor in there. So. What's your measurement for this? Uh, for? for? College and career ready. Uh, it's a variety of uh, ways. This is defined by an agreement um, that came out of the law, uh, which asks that the uh, superintendents association, um, the college presidents, uh, community college presidents, and the Maryland State Department of Education sat down and defined what would be considered uh, college and career readiness. I know Dr. Smith was well steeped in that work, so. Oh. Dr. Johnson and I actually yes, did the and implementation of this law mm -hmm. in 2014. Is the ACT, the SAT, the ACUPLACER that I bashed a few minutes ago, <laughs> the, uh, Choice of the agreement with uh, the local community colleges, if your community has one, we have one, as I shared with you a few minutes ago, about A's or B's in rigorous coursework in the 12th grade. It can be a licensure or certification in a, college, in a career pathway. 
And am I forgetting anything? I think that's everything. Dual enrollment. You, dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. If you do successful completion of dual enrollment, any one of those by the end of 11th grade and then again by the end of 12th grade puts you in this number. And these, this, these particular schools showed that against that measure instead of just on track for graduation accumulation of credits. So this, these increases are significant. And if you watch the clip on the board meeting, we'll send it to you of the three principals talking about what they do, you can see, to, to put it plainly, they're all in. They know everything going on in their schools, and they're just three examples. And we, we find this across many schools about this level of engagement and searching for students and finding ways to support them. Uh, teachers working together with support professionals and administrators to say, how do we reach these 32 kids in the 12th grade? How do we reach these students who are in this program, who need these services? So it, it was pretty exciting to have them there. So when, when you've got a multitude of measures and you have changes like you have on the English language arts, did you go back and look to which measures moved yes. the most? Disaggregate all that and we'll yeah. send that all to you. Okay. It's very interesting. We're going to show you some movement on SAT at the end of this. Mm -hmm. For this measure, just using SAT as part of an effect. So the Park Algebra 1 is one of the reasons you see as an example of that movement in mathematics, because it's one of the external measures that you see back in evidence of learning. I'll point out to you first on this slide that if you look at the end down here, in 2016, June, as school ended, 5,040 students had completed Algebra 1 across all 39 at that time middle schools, because Halley Wells wasn't open. Now we have 41, with Sil or 39 when Halley Wells opened. Now we have 40 with Silver Creek. So this would have been 38 middle schools, 5,040 students. 8,193 middle school eighth graders completed Algebra 1 and the Park test with a qualifying score to meet the high school graduation requirement at the end of last June. That is a significant indication of what's happening for students. Then you look here and you see first our, our monitoring group of uh, primarily white and Asian students that are not in poverty and students of multiple races. They're also in that group. And so you can see they're at 94%, uh, 92%. Uh, from 16 to 18, and then you can see each of the others and the difference. This is significant because when you add large numbers of students, the average goes down. But what you see here is the average only went from 76% to 69% for our African American students not in poverty. Now turn the page, look at that same group of students, and you see that 648 more students were in that group in that time period. In fact, what you see is of those 3,000 students, almost 20, or about 2,500 of them were students of color and or students in poverty or both. That's where we're going to make our impact. Maintain and move, maintain and move. This is among the most the strongest indicator of the increase. And what we know is the corollary to this is at the same time, and we've not pulled this data system-wide yet, but we will, is the number of students, especially students who historically haven't been as easily placed in accelerated math at the elementary school. That's because that's where it starts. And what we know is students having early learning opportunities builds on that. So it all builds over time. Yes. So do park schools have a percent equivalent for level one, two, three, four, five? What In other words, mean? how much you, what percent you got right on the park test? They don't give us any of that information. They don't give any of that information on a state assessment ever. Yeah, it's just the score. We get a one, two, three, four, five. Just like I, I actually think that matters because I know a little bit about how the students score on the test, like the MISPAP and the HSAs. And I know that what counted as proficient were schools that none of us would ever consider were proficient. And so without knowing what they're calling proficient, you can easily get a distorted view of what that score actually means. 
I, I, I'm I understand just, what you're saying, but I would I would challenge you. You and I have had this discussion before. You get credit for wrong answers. I would challenge. I would push on you to really do some investigation, and we'll send you. I had my entire senior leadership team in on Monday night, and we actually took five questions off the park test. All of us, the math test. I would send them to you, and let me know how you do. I'm not. I'm not kidding you. This is a different world. It's a different world for our teachers. It's a different world for our students, because. The, when the National Governors Association came together and created the Common Core State Standards and said we need more rigorous tests, if you think that a mere 40 years ago the standard was the Maryland Functional Math Test, which I'll also send you a copy of that, compare the two. It's profound, uh, Councilmember Elrich. What's changed? I just want to see the score. I want to see the score. Well, and I understand that. But Dr. Johnson and I can send you the equating study that we did while we were there to the SAT. And, you know, if you were getting this level on the park, then you were going to get this score on the SAT and the, and the PSAT. We used a, a standard statistical methodology because I have those same questions and same doubts. All I would say to you is, unless I have some evidence of that, I'm not going to assume that. And as our kids move through, as you said, Council Member uh, Rice, the AP, the SAT, all the other measures, and are, then, then we can have, I, I won't say profound or unlimited uh, confidence, but I'll say some confidence that these things are working together. Like, like my, my question only comes out of actually had experience. I understand. Yep. And having graded the tests. And I know that test, and I remember those so days. I, and they came from the state of education. So having done it once, I would like to be assured this is a did before. Let me just let me just say, before I turn it over to Council Vice President Navarro, that um, we shouldn't judge the old state board as the new state board. There have been a lot of changes that have been made in the past four years. I know, uh, let alone uh, over the past 20, 30 years, when it comes to the state board and what they ask for uh, and what they do regarding their tests. So I'll just put that out there, Council Vice President Navarro. Yeah, I mean, I think that. I understand the question. I, for me, though, obviously, we do have some comparisons here. I mean, we do have our Asian students and our white students, and we're comparing that. Obviously, it's the same measure. Same interest. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, they're doing quite well in terms of moving forward and you know, to college and doing etc. So, so I feel like even though, you know, there have been a lot of issues to examine, the fact that we do have almost like, you know, these populations to kind of compare mm -hmm. um, is, is something that I'm definitely also looking at. And to the extent that we can, you know, move the needle, understanding eventually where we want all students to be, um, that's, that's, I think, something to consider as well. Absolutely. Um, but there is no doubt that I think things have evolved quite a bit because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, for a very long time, we felt very strongly about how we couldn't just accept the state, you know, standards for proficiency, because for us, our standard and our benchmark was much higher, um, and and I think that that's something that we continue to pursue. But again, when I look at the performance of our white students and Asian students and see how well they're doing and how they're moving forward and they're college ready and they, you know, uh, and then I look at our African American and Latino, I want to make sure that we are, you know, using that as a way to um, to bring everybody you know, to, a, to the same level. So. Absolutely, and aside from bad behavior and that the Mr. Elrich is describing, I know the test, it was, it, we stopped using it right after the turn of the century. That's always fun to say. But that test as a principle in this state was not very useful. Even if it had been handled exactly right, it wasn't useful to know the kinds of things you're describing. But it goes back to my little tirade at the beginning. It's easy to look back and know those things. But it was such new thinking. The best thing about No Child Left Behind is it shined a, a bright light on the disparities and the inequities that exist in, in education. It did, in a way that nothing else ever had before. I mean, Brown B. Board of Education said equal access. And so we spent decades just working on equal access, and we're still working on it. 
Now we have to we have to maintain the work on equal access, but now we have to create equal opportunity and equal achievement. Very different things. Access, opportunity, achievement. Access always precedes achievement and opportunity. You don't get in, you have no opportunity, you have no achievement. And we have to change that. And, and that's what this is about. If you look at, um, and I'm going fast because we're on limited time, but if you look uh, at the ones and twos, that's our work. That tells you what the work is to do. These students are still better off because they experienced Algebra 1 in this year than if they had been caught in the spin of basic math and then sent to high school and suddenly they're plopped into Algebra 1. They're still better off by having had this experience. And the goal is to get everyone by the end of ninth grade, everyone, so this is, they're solid in this area. Um, yeah, no, the only, I mean, the only thing I would follow up with is, of course, it is about, you know, access, but also the support that has to go with that. That's right. To make sure that our students who don't have that, you know, the support can, can have the opportunity to succeed. So That's you know, where it is. Yeah, it's the opportunity. It. Yeah. We've all been in circumstances where someone, we walk in and we can see the look in someone's eye that you're not going to be successful either because of you or because of me, you're not going to be successful. And I'm not indicting teachers or principals or superintendents, but that belief system about what students can do and should be able to do, that's expectations. That's opportunity. It is. And, I mean, I just laugh a little bit because, I mean, it has been researched, right? We do have data Absolutely. on students, especially students of color, who make a decision that I will not learn from you because of the minute they walk into a classroom, they immediately can read and tell. Mm -hmm. And I know it from experience of having, you know, daughters who are now very successful, thank God, but, uh, you know, but had a mom that was, that was quite the advocate. Um, and so, you know, this issue of uh, high expectations is one that I know we have been beating that drum for a long time and we have amazing, amazing staff. Um, but it's something that we have to continue to, to work on because always. In, I always hear students, they still, you know, even with our youth town hall, they tell us things like, you know, my counselor was telling me not to apply to a certain college or, you know, not to, we have to continually address that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a never ending, I think, effort. Absolutely. I just wanted to throw one thing out there as we talked about this in Carmen too, and uh, it's something that anecdotally I experienced at my house. Uh, when my daughter came home and said, yeah, we're going to be taking the park, but it really doesn't matter. Now, my daughter got in the high four range, so, I mean, she's learning what she needs to, but I'm concerned about the fact that, again, as we do testing, that doesn't tie into students' grades, and they know this, and they get this. She's 12, but she knows at age 12 that this isn't going to affect her grade and her ability to it's not going to reflect on anything. She's proud, and it's on our refrigerator of her score, and so she's happy about that. So that's great. And that's the reinforcement that's there. But for parents who aren't engaged, uh, who don't know, and aren't aware of what PARC is, I promise you I could go and find out 25% of our parent population who have no idea what the PARC is, right. what it means, what it stands for, what it is, what it does, none of that, at least. So from that perspective, there's still work to be done, I agree, in terms of just making sure, because well, I, I look at these scores and I say they could be better than they are based on the in level of instruction that's happening in our schools. I truly believe that. I believe that a lot of kids come to class and are just like, okay, whatever. They're not preparing for it. They're not thinking about it, even though their teachers are imparting to them that this is important. Um, that's all there is. There's no reinforcement that's at home a lot of times to say, got to get ready for the park, even though principals send out the messages before telling parents, hey, the park is coming up, make sure your children get a good night's rest and get, you know, a, a, a breakfast in the morning and all. all that kind of stuff is great. But if it doesn't happen, it still affects what they're able to do. And so from that perspective, I really think that, again, there's a lot of this that's missing in terms of it's, it's not a true reflection uh, and therefore shouldn't be an indictment on the system. That's right. I believe that we should still aspire to certainly do more, but that's why I've always been one when I'm looking at measures uh, of how we're doing in the classroom and ensuring that our children are performing. I want to look at so many more things beyond park. And you know, we've had this conversation before. I'm not a big fan 
Uh, I'm not a big fan of high stakes testing because so many other things impact it and really don't give us that, but we have to do something. And so I, I, I understand that, you know, uh, part gives us a measure that's there, uh, but I always take that with a grain of salt because there's so many other factors that are always involved in this as well uh, that I don't use that as the litmus test for whether or not our children are performing. I know you don't either, and I know you're not professing that, but I just want to make sure because we are talking about this publicly that folks don't think, well, all our children have to do 90% on a park test, and if not, then that means that they're not learning. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's not right. the case. That's not the case right. at all. So. And that's why we want to triangulate this information to say, you know, the park score is what it is, but look here, in these areas, we, know, we have confidence the student is ready for the next grade level, the next unit, the next semester, whatever it is, they're ready, and, and that is not the sole indicator, because that is just completely inappropriate. And when we think about, so as we think about the impact of schools, um, I'm gonna jump to the page that says, why develop an MCPS equity accountability model? The previous two pages give some background and some rationale, but this says, goes right to what you said. It says, you know, if you work only with the state model, and by the way, I hope our goal and what we've asked the MSD to do now for the last three years, and, and we were working on it before the two of us left, is we can improve park. We can make shorter chunks of time, use game theory to use the easier items first, uh, and make it adaptive so if a student just whizzes through the first three, they jump to number 15. And someone wrote recently, well, adaptive tests cannot be standardized. Well, don't go to the hospital because every nurse in this country took an adaptive standardized <laughs> licensure test. Yeah. I guarantee you that. And as well as many other adaptive standard assessments. So people like to spread their lack of information out there. But reliance on, a, on, reliance on the state is not where we ever want to be. We never want a single test. We, we, scoring on the total population, yeah, but we also want to score, as we've shown here, disaggregated student populations. Pass fail, no, we want to be able to show progress also and we're working toward that. Relative growth compared to others, this gets into the statistical model. The way the state's going to show growth is using uh, percentile, student percentile growth ranking systems, which what that says is if last year you and I did exactly the same, and this year I do the same as I did last year, but you do one point better, you'll be in a higher percentile, I'll be in a lower percentile. Anytime you norm things or put them in percentile ranking, you force losers. You force people. Everybody can gain, and the people who have the least gain will be in the second percentile, the fifth percentile. That is not the message we want to tell people or, or use as the basis for how we do our business. One size fits all, and this is the worst part here, closes the gap by 50% by 2030. So what that means is if the difference right now is 70% for our Hispanic students in poverty and 85% for our uh, white students not in poverty, and that, or even you know any other, whatever that standard is, then we're going to move 7.5% in 12 years. That is not fast enough. It, that is unconscionable. So on the other side, we list what, what we're trying to do here. And you can skip that page, because we're already, that's already wrong from the time we presented it to the board. <clears throat> it's just it's a timeline for, you know, because you've got to keep refining, pulling back, working. So what it's going to do is look at three schools. Here's a model, a mock-up. And it shows you we're going to use assigned values because we don't want to use grades and we don't want to use stars, so we're using numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Five is the highest level of progress or movement. One is the lowest level of movement. And so you can see what happened in these three, for these three schools for our students on whatever the measure was. And we'll just say this is for you know, literacy achievement. And you can see what happened with each group of students. The school can then dig in so the parent can know what's happening in each area. The school can dig in and say, why did this happen? What's the measure? Maybe there's a problem with the measure. Maybe we're not teaching the curriculum to fidelity. Maybe we need to have some cultural proficiency work. Maybe we need all three. And really dig in to see what it is. And if you look on the next page, you can see the key to the EOL assigned values over there in terms of what percent of students met it. And these are the actual numbers for 2018. So these show you the percentages of students right back off the EOL. 
who made this. And so you'd be able to see the same thing about your school in the coming months as we develop this. This is only achievement, however. We also want to work in some other areas I want to show you quickly, because it's not just about achievement. It's also about progress, graduation. It's also, when we talk progress, it's about our ESOL program and our, our Students with Disabilities program. It's also about culture and equity of the school. What's going on in the school with access and with the school culture? And all of those things will be built into this model over time so that we really have a clear picture. You know, I, I really resist the idea that there is anywhere in the world a one-star school or a five-star school. That's a single dimension of a very complex human organization. There are always areas for improvement, always areas where people are excelling and doing well. Thank you. So, okay, so Dr. Smith, are you saying that each school will have these measures? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so how will you be able to communicate, especially now that we have a great number of schools that have majority, you know, African American or Latino students, you know, farm students? I mean, these are obviously schools where we know you may not have a very active PTA, you may not have a very active, you know, parent. How are these parents going to even understand so that they can be empowered to advocate for their children? I, that would be my first question. And then my second question has to do with when we talk about this issue of equity, then of course inevitably we have to think about, you know, staff that reflects the student population. You know, um, I'm still getting feedback from certain schools where they may not have a bilingual person in the office, for example, and parents feel frustrated because they want to participate, but they don't have access to that. Um, I'm reminded of, um, as you are embarking in this, you know, curriculum, um, uh, you know, changes, the, this very important uh, consideration to make sure that this curric the curriculum actually reflects your student population, right? Um, so this whole notion of cultural, you know, proficiency and racial equity um, has to be, you know, dealt with right head on because if not we're just literally spinning our wheels so how are you going to address all of that within this context so that yes you know parents feel empowered so the students see themselves reflected and uh, this message of yes you matter right and i'm providing this opportunity but look you matter to us because you see yourself there reflected how are we doing how is that all integrated and in, in as as we build out these measures the, the goal is in, in the future, and I don't mean years from now, uh, but in the future to have dashboards where this will be available. The primary work will be the responsibility of the school to share it with their parents, to talk with their parents in conferences, in parent meetings, with our parent community coordinators. And one of the strategies that we've already adopted and we're trying to push more and more, and as I think about my my budget that I'll present to the board and I'll present to you about having more people doing that kind of work. We don't, we can't add hundreds of people, but we can add consistently every year and we've been doing that to push this work out so that people don't have to always just come to the school to get it or come to the school system to get it. And so that will be a critical part of it is constantly pushing it out and engaging families, whether we're talking about my specific child or all of the children in the third grade or all the children in this school because you're absolutely right the that level of engagement is is well, essential right i mean I, I i would only share that we all understand that resources are not going to be abundant mm -hmm. yep. coming forward uh, and i was really struck by a conference that i attended when i was a member of the board in a principal from a very poor I think it was something like 99% farms school in the border with Mexico, um, where they turned everything around because they literally tasked every single person in that school with almost like a caseworker, mm -hmm. right? So your job was to kind of like, almost like adopt, if you will, three or four mm -hmm. students because mm -hmm. they didn't have the resources to add more parent community coordinators, right. more people, personal workers. and so. I just hope that there's also some innovative and creative thinking because I worry that if our answer is always we're going to have to have more resources for X, Y, and Z, I feel like we're setting ourselves up as it's going to be difficult to, you know, to, to sustain that model, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so I'm really looking to that as well uh, from the board and from, from all of you of how could we learn from 
some of these you know other jurisdictions who don't have as much money but have found very innovative ways mm -hmm. of uh, really turning things around uh, by empowering you know all of uh, staff and and some of that happens informally I think in our county um, but it would be really wonderful you know I remember having a conversation with Wheaton High School uh, attendance uh, secretary <laughs> who was were going to the graduation and she was so proud because she could point to all these students mm -hmm. that she personally would make sure she would t say to me and sometimes I would call the parents and say how come you, you know but she made sure now nobody tasked her with that but if we could somehow formalize some of these things right we may be able to then gain more capacity <coughs> um, to, to, to address this so so I just you know I just share that absolutely as, as an area of, of real interest um, that maybe we could experiment and try to see if, if that helps because it's <coughs> going to be hard to just, you know, to add a lot more um, given some of the fiscal challenges. That's a really good point and, and I, I need to go back and clarify that can't be the only strategy. Yeah. That is one strategy. Earlier in this conversation I made the connection that I said we can no longer just talk about this is math content. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about and, that, and all of our professional learning for our staff members, support professionals, right administrators, teachers, everyone, has to be that integrated approach. Right. And that's how we'll get to what yes. you're describing. Not by saying, my job is teaching Correct. French, that's all I do, or my job is being the principal, you know, I, I'm here at the school, I don't go into the neighborhood. Right. Everybody has to yeah. be responsible. I know Adrian Morrow, who's a school director now and works with principals, was the principal of East Silver Spring which, by the way, one of our teachers got the Milken Award yes. last Friday morning, yes. big surprise, $25,000. And I was at that school for a couple of hours at that event. But when she was at that school, I highlighted, they made some tremendous gains for their students. And I highlighted uh, her at an ANS meeting and had her talk about this. And they have that sort of mm -hmm. approach there. And she, she makes it very simple, all hands on deck. And that's, it just, when she said that, I thought, wow, that is, that says it so clearly. We all are responsible for this in, in how we move ahead in our community. So yeah, and if, appreciate if, you bringing yeah, that up. Yeah, and if we yeah. could, if we could somehow integrate that. So again, it's not, you know, just dependent on a particular school that really understands this, but that we integrate that as a best practice. I think we'll see a lot of, you know, a lot of progress. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't also bring up the fact that in our youth town hall, you know, I would say, gosh, 90% of the, of the conversation and the things, the issues the students brought up had ought to do with just, you know, the bullying issue, the not mm -hmm. feeling safe. That, so, so it is very hard to learn if you're feeling this way and if you're experiencing this. And it was very startling to me because in the past we have had students really come up and share. This time it was just across the board. Mm -hmm. One, you know, it was just really kind of overwhelming, and and um, so so you know, once again, just I mean, I know it's a you know it's a sample, <laughs> um, but <coughs> it came up quite a bit, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that you know probably stress and a lot of everybody's feeling out there. There's a lot of trauma happening. I know that also has a major impact. So so as we're looking at all the ways that we can get to you know moving the needle, that's something that I also you know as you bring your budget. <laughs> Uh, I would like to to see how we can respond to to strengthen that area because it is very difficult if these students are under that much stress to be able Absolutely. To, to you know we can implement all of this, but if they're dealing with all these other external issues, it's, it's not you know we're not going to see the outcomes that we want. I was with about 150 students last night, and we had many of the same conversations. Mm -hmm. So I just mm -hmm. I heard this last night, and it fit exactly with what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the equity accounting model. We're at the very beginning of that. We're not going to take 10 years to build it, but we're going to build it out over time. And it will have, as I said, this is the achievement. It will have progress and then specific areas of progress for everyone and then specific areas of progress for our English learners and students with disabilities. For high schools, it will have graduation. It will have equity and culture which will have measures built into it to look at access and the culture of the school. You know, the state is using that as part of their culture, as part of their uh, accountability model, and we're going to have some data from them through that as they build that out. We'll use that data and other tools that will, and then finally it'll have a, a local priority from a school. 
So a school, part of that, these numbers will be built on what's, what's the local issue, local goal, local work that you're looking forward to in, in your school, because that's important for people to own uh, part of it. They own all of these things, but that they get to say, our school is uniquely this or that. Um, but that so, and it will be the, the constantly looking at and uh, analyzing the impact for these five focus groups and always monitoring the standard and the students who've reached that or exceeded that standard. And that's the methodology to think about it so that we have some sense across schools that, uh, because there's a lot of, of myths out there about this or that. I mean, you can go to the most prestigious, highly competitive college from any high school in this county and students do every single year. And yet people perceive that, oh, if you don't go to these set of schools, you don't, you don't even have a chance. It's just not true. And so we both need to confront the reality and bust the myths. Those are both important. So I'm going to move on for the sake of time. Um, and let's look at some SAT data in the back. And I want, because it's very interesting and exciting, and so I'll ask Dr. Johnson to talk about that SAT data. <clears throat> sure, thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, with the support of our Montgomery County community and the council and the county executive, uh, MCPS introduced a program that supports um, students' college and career readiness by the time they graduate. Uh, introduced in our budget in 2018 was the uh, idea that we would allow all of our students paid for by the county to take either the SAT, the ACT, or, or career placement exam. And that is in our budget. It will be in our budget uh, as long as we want it to be there. But we thought it was important that if there is a requirement for students to be college and career ready, that we provide an opportunity for them to meet uh, that standard. So as you can see on this first page, uh, what we've tried to do is to show you data around the students who took it in 2017 versus the, two, the students who took it in 2018. 2018 was the first time that we paid for it, and so you can see there was a market increase in the number of students who took it. Now, SAT, unlike ACT, offers an SAT school day, and we decided to participate in the SAT school day for most of our schools because it truly was an equity issue. A lot of our students, even though we were paying for the exam, uh, were, were unable to take the exam because they could not get to another school on a Saturday or another day in order to take it. So SAT school day allows the students to take it during the school day at their home school. And you will notice that because of that, the numbers have gone up tremendously. Uh, we've, we're introducing information here that shows our focus groups and the number of students who participated, 64 to 65, 56 to 61. Now, I need to note that these are just students who took the SAT. These are not students who took the ACT or the career um, uh, licensure examination. So these numbers are going to be very different uh, in comparison to 100% because you had about 30, um, maybe 30, 35% of them who either took the ACT or a career license exam, and we would only pay for one. The school district only paid for one. So then if you look at grade 11 participation in those groups, you can see it was in the 80s, in the 70s, and in and, and the uh, high 60s for all of those students. But then if you look at the data around the students who met the MCCR literacy through the SAT, you can see those numbers there in the far right column compared to the students in 2017. And you can see there was an increase in, in those students who met it using uh, the SAT, which was, which was really good. Going on, if you look at the students who were meeting MCCR literacy via the SAT, by focus groups, you can see that there was a jump. Look at the jump between the non-farms black African-American students and the farms, Hispanic Latino students, because they were able to take the exam during the school day. And there were no barriers in place for those students. They come to school, they take the exam, and then um, they don't have to worry about buses to get to the various uh, SAT uh, sites in order to take the exam. 
Then in looking at the math, and as Dr. Smith has mentioned, math continues to be a challenge for us. We didn't see market increases in students who met um, CCR through the math exam, but we did see some. Um, we saw about five out of the 11 subgroups um, made it. And this is just students, and it should be noted, these are students who are taking the SAT for the very first time. And so we expect most students take either the SAT or the ACT more than once, so we would expect that those scores would improve, and the number of percentage of students who are meeting it um, with the SAT would improve because most of them take it more than one time. This is 11th grade. They have a same opportunity in 12th grade. Now, of course, we will not pay for it if they have, it's already been paid for it by them, by us, but there will be an opportunity for them uh, to take it again. Grade 11 students meeting uh, math via the, the SAT. Uh, still some work in that particular area. However, the participation rate for the class of uh, 2018, this is their data, um, an increase for those students. Um, 1,490 students participated in the SAT, although these students were 11th graders in 2017, some of them were able to take the exam in 2018 because they had not met their CCR status yet, but we saw an increase of almost 1,500 students uh, with the 2000, class of 2018. So the average SAT score for the class of 2018, as you can see, there was an increase for almost every subgroup compared to 2017. And those increases, um, Minimal in some cases, um, more in other cases, but we're always looking for the gains, and that's what we were able to see there. And then, again, the SAT performance class of 2018 students, again, meeting the college and career readiness benchmark. Uh, four out of five of the focus groups made it in that area, increased in that area. And then SAT performance for the class of 2018 18 focus groups. This is information that basically gives you a compilation of how those students are performing based upon the percent who took it, their most recent SAT score, and from that SAT score, the number of students who met the CCR benchmark. It's important to note that in order to meet the benchmark in, and they changed it just last year, in um, English literacy, they have to have a score of at least 500 or 520 in order to make it in math, they have to have a score of 480. And so this reflects that information. So we, we adhere to the philosophy of confront the facts. Mm -hmm. Red, bad, or indifferent, we confront the facts. And so you know, just show you things that are happy and rosy. Right. And, 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 and one of those things that I did want to just highlight is, is that, and it's something that specifically it looks as within our Hispanic Latino community, that we've got both whether you're farms or non-farms, that folks just aren't taking the SAT at the same levels as their either uh, uh, counterparts of color or their uh, non-color counterparts. And so from that perspective, it's an interesting one in which I think that we need to delve into that a little bit more. I think that, again, what uh, Councilmember Navarro was talking about in terms of community engagement and really getting out to and seeing, because I'm sure that they're, it may, it's going to be different between different schools, right? So um, finding out where in those communities, and that's where we can do that community activism and work to get out there and work with different nonprofit organizations like CASA and Identity and others that are specifically focused on those areas and get folks to understand how important it is to do this and to do it more than once so that you can gain the experience. And so while Again, taking it for the first time, which is something that I, I think we should be incredibly proud about because what it means to me is that, and even though the scores may not be where we want them to be at this point, the fact that they're taking it and we have more kids that are taking it is incredibly important because it talks about their new level of thinking in terms of, well, I'm considering, because oftentimes a person who takes the SAT is now thinking about going to college, college right. right? I mean, you don't just take the SAT just to take the SAT. You take it because you're thinking about going to college. And so from that perspective, having more students 
who are thinking about going to college is a success for us. Access precedes everything else. That's it. And, and I think one of the things that you, this is important because this was the very first time yes. we administered um, the SAT, either through school day and the SAT, I mean the ACT on Saturday and the SAT on Saturday. As we continue to introduce this program to more and more students, we should see an increase in those numbers and our principals are working with us. We only did SAT school day in 18 of our 25 high schools last year. We're doing it in all of our high schools this year. And so we should see an increase the next time we come and present to you, we should be able to talk about how we've seen a market increase in not only uh, participation, but performance of our students. Mm -hmm. I think doing the test is great. Yeah. The test, I hated waking up on one more day on the set. <laughs> it's like, really? I'm Get so to the real thing. Even <laughs> when I was 17 years old, this is not what I wanted to do. Um, but, but speaking of access, somebody texted a question, education activist, and she asked about the University of Maryland and the university requirements for admission and wanted to know where we stood with that, that Maryland had introduced some change in standards that resulted in a drop in yes. kids who were eligible. USM did change their standard, mm -hmm. and then the Maryland State Department of Education two years ago mm -hmm. said you can move to the new standard or not, mm -hmm. and MCPS did move to this new standard, and it resulted in a drop uh, in the number of kids that were qualified. Mm -hmm. And Janet, you want to talk more about that? So the Janet's analyzed that every direction for so, me. So the standard um, had been uh, a C average, average. Right. That's the important, that's the operative word there. Then it changed to be defined as a C or higher in specified classes. So that's a higher standard because moving from an average, you can have a D and a B, a C, <laughs> it changed the level of rigor in the way we uh, viewed what our, how our kids' outcomes were and what we could report. But getting a D in the semester wouldn't have necessarily, or did it necessarily bump you out of eligibility? It's it's the end of year average. Okay, so a semester in itself wouldn't have. And when, is this you said the whole system? Yes. So basically, you can't get into the system unless you start with a community college at that point. If you, can't, that, if you can't get admitted. That's likely. No one knows exactly right. how students are admitted to the U university system, the College Park and others. But what you'd say is that's the, the standard of the guidance, and somewhere above and below that, everyone who comes in fits into that world. And, you know, it's just because they use all sorts of factors. So. And again, that's just, again, it's one indicator. And so when their admissions yeah. offices are sitting there looking at it, that's just one standard that they use. Because uh, there's so many different colleges within the university system of Maryland that you have to look at different uh, ways in which you can provide opportunities for students from various backgrounds. And we're talking here about a threshold. And I would push back that College Park should be the threshold. I would say if you can go to credit-bearing courses, at Montgomery College mm -hmm. and make progress. If you can earn a licensure certification in a career pathway, or if you can do both of those things and 10 other things, we have allowed you to choose from among the many options available in our society. It's wonderful if a student has 10, uh, 10, 10 options and 10 choices, but if they have 10 options and no choices, we've failed. If they have two good choices, that's, that's the foundational level. We want everybody at or above the foundation. That's the goal. So I, I don't see College Park as, as my goal. I see, you know, the sky's the limit and we're going to get everybody to the threshold, the foundational level. One of the, just um, yeah. Councilman Elridge, I, I need to make a point, and that is one of the things that you will probably see in subsequent years, particularly the next three to four years, is our robust dual enrollment program. With Montgomery College, we 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 uh, graduated eight students from Northwest, seven or eight students from Northwood last year, who um, graduated not only with their high school diploma but with their AA degree, and so we are increasing those programs uh, year after year, adding more students to those programs, and so that will be a way because once those students have the AA degree, the University of Maryland must accept them. Right. 
That's what I said. Yeah. If you get through the community college. Mm-hmm. I, think, I, I think that's I would I would like to see a rapid expansion of the dual degree program, and I hope someday we can make the University of Maryland focus on state of Maryland students instead of racking up high out of state with foreign tuitions and sacrificing up public bills um, to people who, you know, it basically so our kids can't get into a school that we pay in, pay in our tax money. Well, most of our students are, those students are taking advantage of it because for them, for the most part, it's free. And so they get that two-year degree, and so they only have two years more when they go on to a four-year university to pay for. And it's becoming very, very popular uh, around the county with more and more students. We haven't had a great increase, though, in Montgomery College enrollment. And so, in fact, we've had a decline in enrollment. So. You would be enrolled at, keep in mind, that, that's not considered because you're enrolled still in MCPS. Right. So well, no, I was enrollment. talking about just right. in general. Just, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. My right. concern is they really are sealing this university off from everybody else, sure. from, from Maryland residents, yeah. and that's not right. right. Councilman Aldridge, I've fielded questions before about the USM, and I just want to mention that there is a comparative chart out there, of course, with all the other LEAs. We're not sure to the degree that the other LEAs may have instituted the change the second year and moved to the average. If they didn't catch it in the manual, Mm -hmm. they would have reported the same year, the same way they did the year prior. We caught it. We follow the rules. Mm -hmm. So we reported that way. And because some districts were noted not to go down, we went down when we switched to the new rules. And so I, I think that's that's caused a lot of questions among uh, folks out, out yes. there. And so, and, but we don't have any way of knowing whether the other LEAs reported the same way that we were asked to report. I just thought I would note that. Thank you. Okay. I think that answered. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for, again, a uh, very robust uh, presentation. I know, and unfortunately, we had to hustle through a lot of it, but um, we, we understand the direction that we're headed in is an, as a positive one. Increasing access uh, and opportunity for our kids will ultimately result in their success. Uh, the more that they have that they're able to uh, get support, the more that we're able to identify schools in particular areas that may need additional supports, whether it be inside of the school or outside of the school when it comes to some of our equity policy lenses that we're looking to place on a lot of the things that we're doing within Montgomery County. Together, partnership-wise, we are certainly going to be able to utilize this data to help us. I will just say one thing in closing, that I know that for us at Kerwin, uh, when it comes to farms, we're also looking at looking at Medi- Medicaid data instead, and looking at that as a better determinant uh, of where some of our challenged areas may be. And so I look forward to, as we start to head in that direction, how we can help to incorporate and facilitate that with all of our LEAs as well. Uh, And certainly that will, uh, I think, uh, hope to get us a little bit of a better uh, dive into a lot of these areas that may not seem as though uh, we have some of the challenges we do, especially when it comes to lower income, because folks aren't filling out the farms information sheets. And so from that perspective, I think we still have a lot of hidden pockets of poverty in a lot of our communities. And so being able to get to those will help even more so because then, again, what happens is we look at farms data and we look at those numbers and the performance, and then we say, well, why isn't this school performing? Well, because we don't have a true grasp of what our problem truly is. And so from that perspective, I I think that will help us uh, as we get to dive into even more supports for those folks. So, all right, well, thank you very much. Again, appreciate it. Look forward to working with you guys throughout this next budget cycle. We're adjourned.